Is religious freedom dangerous? This is the Citizen Link Report. Hi, I'm Stuart Shepard along with our president, Tom Minnery. Hi, Tom. Hello, Stuart. Let's talk about Indiana. Indiana passes a law to affirm religious freedom. Apple CEO Tim Cook comes out and says it's very dangerous. And then we have Charles Barkley, the NBA star, who comes out and says they should move the Final Four basketball tournament out of Indianapolis because of this law. Why is Indiana getting hit so hard over a law that essentially just reaffirms the First Amendment? Well, that's a good question. Uh, the reason we're into this great controversy is we're seeing a war against religion by the liberal left. And this is what that looks like when it, the battleground is a reasonable piece of legislation to protect people's religious liberty in one state, Indiana. Now, now I dare say that anyone who's been watching the news does not have an accurate idea of what this law actually does because there's been so much misleading information, so many false claims from folks on the other side of this issue about what it does. What does the bill do? If government requires me to do something that disagrees with my religious faith. If, for example, in Indiana, if the Amish are required to obey all highway regulations, drive a horse at 45 miles per hour, that's an unfair burden on their religion. This law gives them a right to go into court and have their day. It also gives government a right to go into the same court and say, why they want to burden the religion of the Amish this way. And then the court decides. Prior to this, that kind of access was not allowed for religious believers in Indiana. Is this new? No, it is not. This has been existing in federal law for about 22 years, and states have been left behind, so they have had to pass their laws individually. 19 states now have done just that. And, uh, and Indiana makes 20. Well, it does. And in addition, 10 more state court systems have in their court precedents allowed the same kind of protection. So this is nothing new. But in the age of Twitter, in the age of um, emotion rather than studied thought, this is, and a liberal agenda, this is what you get. So the governor has come out and said, we're, we're going to fix this, we're going to work on this. What do you think about what he said in a news conference that happened just before we recorded this? Is there a fix needed? The governor said, this law does not provide a license to discriminate. He said that over and over. And of course, that is true. The law does not give somebody carte blanche or a license to discriminate. It allows you to show up in court and the government has to show their reasons why they believe they have a compelling interest in preventing your religious activity. Here's, what, here's what's at stake here. Yeah. Uh, it's a small, the small businesses that we've seen, the floral company that does not want to involve itself in a gay wedding, a baker that does not want to bake cupcakes for a gay wedding, a photographer that does not want to photograph a gay wedding. Uh, should these people have the right based on their sincerely held religious belief not to do this? We say yes. The law says you get a chance to go into court and to make this case. And I think those on the left would say, no, your religious belief belongs inside your church. When you're outside your church, you must conform and you must um, agree to do business even though it may um, subvert your religious belief. And, and this gives us a, a good opportunity to explain what the overstatement is from the other side. We keep hearing, well, this is an opportunity to, and I even heard this on a conservative radio station out at Denver, to refuse service. And they make it sound as if someone's going to get thrown out of a restaurant or someone who, who is having a heart attack that a first responder is not going to help them out. But what's actually happened in real life is we had the example of the florist you mentioned. She had regular customers who were gay who came into her shop. They got to know each other and, and they came to her and said, okay, now will you do a custom flower arrangement for our same-sex wedding? She said, I'm happy to have you as customers, but I can't do the wedding. She turned down the event not the people. They, she had served them 
repeatedly over the years in the store by selling them flowers. So the claim now is, well, they're refusing service, but the truth is that they're refusing to participate in an event that runs against their religious conviction. And this is all new, and the reason it's all new is because of the existence of same-sex marriage, and there is some concern among those of us who are religious that the Supreme Court is now going to kick out the struts from underneath the remaining states that uh, recognize uh, traditional marriage, and that in this new era of uh, same-sex marriage, anyone who does not salute that, uh, even though one has a sincere religious belief about that, is going to be punished by the state. And that is the fear, and that's what brings a bill like this to the Indiana State Legislature to become law. And it's important to, to mention again, this bill is much broader than just that issue, but that's what the firestorm has been about. Tom, we worked very closely and very actively with our allies in Indiana to help get this thing passed. We just want you to know that we were involved in this. Yeah, we did, and we did so uh, proudly, and we cannot do it without the support of people who uh, are constituents of CitizenLink. It is an eminently reasonable bill. In fact, let me read you what somebody said about the federal version of this law in 1993 when that law took effect. And we're talking about state law. It's been in federal law for a long time. Uh, this person said, the founders have seen that religion and religious institutions have brought forth faith and discipline, community and responsibility over two centuries for ourselves and enabled us to live together in ways that would not have been possible otherwise. And he's talking about the space that needs to be uh, maintained between government mandates and religious freedom. And the person who said that was President Bill Clinton as he signed the federal version of this bill into law back in 1993. This whole fight gives us a hint at what opponents of this kind of law are really after. It's not a concern for freedom or equality. What is it? Do sexual rights trump religious rights? Uh, the liberal side says yes. The, those from the Christian faith community say no. The First Amendment says the uh, first protection is religious freedom. We'll see how that principle holds up as this battle wash itself out. Okay, as we close, I want to get your encouragement for other states that are currently considering this kind of legislation. What would you say to them? Stuart, I think it would be very helpful if the Indiana legislature found a way to adjust the law so the essence of it is preserved, but the ob obnoxious attacks against it uh, can be deflected. I don't know how they will do that, but many more states need to address this legislation. We'll be helping them to do that. We'll see what the legislature is able to do. It, it apparently intends to clarify itself. I hope they do not reverse it, reverse themselves uh, because it is a good law and a sound law. Very helpful. Tom, thank you for your insights. Hey, you're Appreciate welcome, that. And thank you for watching. We encourage you to pray for Governor Mike Pence, who signed this thing. He's taking a lot of heat right now. Pray for his peace of mind and that he will help guide his state in an appropriate direction as they navigate all of this. And remember to stand tall and be heard.